Peter and John were arrested and beaten for saying that Jesus had risen from the dead. Upon their release from prison and their return back to the other Jesus followers, they didn't hunker down and pray for safety. They didn't pray for deliverance from their oppressors. They, they weren't just in a funk and depressed and wondering, what are we going to do now? What will happen to us if we continue on this path? No. Look at what they did. They gathered together and they prayed for courage. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Uh, they, they didn't pray for cover or camouflage. They wanted a, a big stir around themselves. They wanted to be noticed. And so they prayed, stretch out your hand and, and heal and, and perform signs and wonders throughout everywhere in, in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They weren't going to go underground where it was safe and secret. They wanted a large public spectacle so that everyone might know without a doubt that this Jesus who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and died was now very much alive. And he was healing and doing signs and wonders now through his people. It, it wasn't something that was going to be kept quiet. They wanted it out there. And, and they are now ones who, despite what the kings and the rulers and authorities do, if they just band together, and it won't matter now because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father and He's in charge. And His marching orders take this message to the street. The resurrection and life. Take it to the ends of the earth. So, why on earth were they like that then? Why, why would they pray for courage when we don't? You know, why were they so willing just to give up all of their wealth and, and just consider nothing their own private property? We definitely don't do that. Why would there be no needy person among them? Because at times to time there would be these sales of land and property and the money dispersed and given to the, the apostles at their feet. Well, the answer is that they were all one in heart and mind. Which was really something when you think about, you know, fishermen and farmers, government office workers and housewives, Slaves and business owners, homeless families and wealthy individuals, this diverse group of people from small rural villages to large cities, they found a oneness and unity. How was that possible? Well, it was all possible because they all saw the same thing the resurrected and living Jesus with their own eyes or by faith through the eyewitness accounts and testimonies of those who had seen Jesus. And then there was their prayer time. When they got through praying, the room shook with the power and the presence of the one who had been raised from the dead. The, the Holy Spirit was in and among them all. Oh yeah, Jesus is alive and now it, this message will go on and on. Nothing can now stop it. And so they would take it to the streets and to anyone who would hear this news as news, as the facts, the truth that Jesus has been raised from the dead, they would receive a new kind of life. A life very much like the one Jesus had having risen from the dead. A life that could not be extinguished by death. A life that is lived in the power and the love and the indwelling of God Himself. This, this is what propelled them so that in the face of sacrifice, oh, our, our money, in the face of pain and suffering, 
Oh, you're going to beat us now? Whatever. In the face of sorrow in the death of their loved ones as they would become martyrs for the faith, even in the face of this extreme loss, it was nothing compared to this life with Jesus in His kingdom, in this love and, and life, nothing compared to it. And now, having this life, well, it just changed everything. And here, here we are. You know, we're, we're really nothing like them, are we? I mean, how did that, how did that on fire movement of people empowered by God and the Holy Spirit who had completely sold themselves out to Jesus and His mission. How did these people turn into us? And how we live out the faith. Now, I'm not saying that we're any less than what they are. We are just as passionate. But we're just passionate about different things. I mean, go to a football game, right? We are just as sold out and willing to do the hard work and sacrifice. We're even willing to suffer and die if needed, but just for different things. Even though we believe, like they do, that Jesus has died, He has been raised, and that His kingdom has come, and that we can be in it, we believe this very same things, and yet... We see something different. We're going in a different direction than those who are described in Acts chapter 4. I mean, it's just undeniable. And, and the question then for us today is, well, why? What do we see and why are we going the direction we are with our faith? And I suppose there's, there's lots of different examples that I could use, but the one I want to share with you that really gets at it of why the difference in the change has to do with my house. We, we bought this house back in 1993 when we first moved to Wichita because we needed a place to live. Okay, I mean, it, this isn't rocket science, but, but more than that, we also wanted a place, because it was just Debbie and myself, we wanted a place to eventually raise a family. And so that was our vision for house hunting. W whatever neighborhood, whatever schools, it, it really needs to have a certain square footage, three bedrooms, two baths, a basement, that's kind of what it is that we're looking for. But one house really would be just as good as another house if it met that requirement. So that was our, our vision and our mission. And that was true until we found this house. We had money on another house, but when we saw this one, Oh yeah, that's, that's our house, over here on Taft Street. And then, what was our original vision of just finding a house to raise our family changed to, you no, know, this particular house now has our heart. Because now having lived there this many years, it's no longer a living room in which we gather and any living room would have been just the same. No, this is the room we watched our kids learn how to walk in. This is the room we've decorated the Christmas tree year after year after year. This is the room that we get out the cards and we play. And, and this, is, this room has those kind of sentimental attachments. And the bedrooms, it's no longer, well, any bedroom would do. You could put a bed in and your dressers. No, this bedroom now has a name and a history. Well, that's Matthew's room. And once there's this tie to the heart. It's like, well, I don't really want to move to any other house. I mean, yeah, I mean, our house isn't perfect. Sure, who wouldn't want a bigger room here and there? And, but if you, even the thought of moving, it's like, wow, you'd have to leave behind all those really cherished memories. That would be really hard. But you're thinking, okay, so he loves his house. You know, good. I mean, a lot of, that's, that's nice, you know. I mean, a lot of people would be so lucky to love their house and have those kind of good memories. The reason I'm sharing that is that we do the very same thing with our church, with our congregation, with the facilities. 
What started off as the original vision and mission of Jesus to go into all the world for the outsider and share the news as news that Jesus has risen from the dead. As we take that and now work out our answer, well, how are we going to do that here in Wichita? We need some kind of space to gather children and teach them in Sunday school. We, we need some kind of answer of a room to, to gather and proclaim that message in worship. But once we've answered that question, the room becomes awfully dear. Why, this is where we've celebrated Easter, and Christmas Eve, year after year. Why, that band back there, the Mercers, why, we're awfully dear to them, and they're dear to us, and, and we don't want to be without them. And, and then, you know, the Kevin in the morning, he's good too. And then you go over to Tyler, oh, the organ for the organ people. Oh, the organ, you know, and, and then the pews and the hymnals. Ah, oh, and those stained glass windows. I mean, everything begins to have a really dear spot in the heart. And what started off as a vision of Jesus, go, it's for them, proclaim this message, gets changed to, well, this is how we're going to do it. And that answer becomes the vision and the mission. And we're just as passionate and die hard as anyone else, and especially Acts chapter 4 people, when it comes to our vision and our mission. Why, just think of changing what and how we've answered how we're going to do things. I mean, yeah, we could, we could have a lot of different things and it'd work better, but oh, this is dear to our hearts. And the, and the ministries that we do here, imagine without a G-force, imagine without Stephen ministry, oh. And that's where we find ourselves. And it's not just us. Okay, this isn't a unique problem to Ascension Lutheran. It's, it's every gathering of Jesus' followers since the time of Peter and John have had to deal with the particular answers that they've come up with of how we'll fulfill this vision of Jesus in which that answer has become dear to the heart. And then it becomes what's important. It becomes what must be died for. So what we find here is that we're really, we aren't dealing with a theological problem. And that's what's a little bit confusing for us church people because we're really keen on theology and we're like, well, wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. You know, and as long as, as long as you're like doing what the Bible says, you know, what our, what our Lutheran theology says, then we're thinking, well, we have no problems then. You know, as, as long as we're theologically correct. But this isn't a theological problem. And it's not even a moral problem, like, you know, we're doing something bad. You're like, oh, stop it. You know, that, there is no stop it to this. And so we're thinking, well, if, it's, if we're not bad theology around here, and we're not doing evil things, what's the problem? Here it is. It's a problem of love. We have, we have a, a love out of order. We love something at a higher priority than maybe it should be fourth or fifth. We have put it at number one. And that priority is our answers, our vision. And as we look at this priority, it's very challenging. But you know, we do have some, a good model. We have, we have some good examples of, of what a proper priority and order of love is in the Acts chapter 4. Just look at what they did and how they did it. They, they looked at their own personal safety and they said, Pff. They looked at their personal finances and they went, ah. They, they looked at all their personal preferences and they went, uh-uh. Everything was in the back seat for the number one priority of Jesus and his vision. We're taking this to the streets. We're, we're here for everyone else in this world that does not know that Jesus truly has risen from the dead. He has this kingdom in which you enter it by faith. And once there, you have a life that cannot die. You have forgiveness. You have love from God that will not end. If you don't have that, you are condemned. But if you have it as a gift, you have life. But they were also people who prayed, saying, Lord, we... We know that unless you lead us with courage 
Unless you lead us forward, we will we'll just do our own thing. And so lead us. Well, we are no less people who are loved by Jesus than Acts 4. We too, just like them, are people who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Jesus lives in us. And he has made us holy by his blood shed at the cross. His Holy Spirit is just among us as it was then. It should not surprise us any more than it did them if that, at the end of our prayers, our sanctuary shakes. And so let our prayer be the same. Let our heart be as changeable and, and flexible and ready to move as theirs wherever the Spirit moves, whatever needs to be done, that there's nothing so dear that it could not be put in the back seat. And Jesus, how now do you desire that we together keep your vision for the other people first priority? And so what I have for you in our deep and wide, and this is our last you know, formal sermon about it, but not the last you'll hear about it. But I have, I have a rather long document. It's the front and back of one page of these four things. Of, this is your take home for this week. And that as we move forward, that there are four things in the next many years to work on, to be led by Jesus. And they have to do with structure, uh, excuse me, the culture. And creating the kind of culture where that number one priority is Jesus his mission for the outsider. And then there's a structure that needs to be in place so that we can together easily move where the Spirit is moving us. And that Spirit is moving us to be fully formed into Jesus. To be like Him in our hearts, in our minds. And then to facilitate that, we will need facilities. And there will be perhaps additions here at the Maple Campus so there can be seven-day-a-week ministry. And over at Tyler to renovate and to look at colors and our, putting our best first impression out for, for those who would come and hear about Jesus. And then there's the staffing. How will there be leadership for everything that we're doing as we're following Jesus? The, there is nothing that is a number one priority that, that's up here that isn't a second, third, or fourth, or fifth behind Jesus and His call, go into all the world. Amen.